Yes, that, that's we'll take everything slowly. We're, those of us in our time zone, uh, this is the evening, so we have uh, between now and our bedtime, there's not, not much more to do. So anyway, so um, uh, let me welcome you all to this uh, very uh, special occasion, uh, namely uh, a lecture by Dr. Erika Hunter, who uh, is not just affiliated researcher at the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Cambridge, Thames in Cambridge. Um, she, and not only was she a senior lecturer here at SOAS for, for many years, um, but um, she is also the founder of the um, Center of World Christianity. So uh, this is a very, um, it's a great honor to have you here as uh, our speaker this evening. Um, uh, I have uh, a long list of publications that I could um, uh, mention in this context going back until 1989, I think, um, which um, all deal with um, the history of uh, Christianity in, in the Middle East, but especially the, um, the um, uh, Eastern uh, Orthodox traditions that, that we find in uh, Syria, in Iraq, um, you have contributed to a great number of uh, uh, publications as um, uh, of edited volumes as uh, author, um, uh, as well as um, uh, in encyclopedic publications. So you have a, um, a track record, a publications record, um, which uh, stretches back into the 1980s and uh, the lecture tonight uh, can therefore be regarded as a summary, a, a subtotal of your uh, academic achievements to date. So I, having said this, I don't want to um, uh, waste any more words, and I would like to pass um, the word to you as the speaker of tonight's seminar. Well, thank you very much, Lars, and can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Right. Well, um, I've put the slideshow up. Have you got that? Have I shared the slideshow? Not yet. No. No. Ah, well, um, hang on. How do I do this? Uh, on the green tab? Uh, 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 back to meeting. Hang on. Oh, dear. Back to meeting. Right. I Right, share screen, of course. Um, I've just, right. So it's a great pleasure and I can see many friends from many years. I won't say old friends, long-standing friends from all sorts of different walks of my academic career. And thank you very much, Lars. And one of the great pleasures has been that Lars has been very active in taking over the center of world Christianity, I rather feared that it might slide into oblivion like so many different aspects of Zoaz did two years ago, but um, Zoaz has survived, the center has survived, and Lars has worked very actively in a whole range of different regions to promote the concept of uh, world Christianity. But I'm going to take us now to an area that has been a main interest of mine for many years and is a continuing interest to the Christian presence at Turfan, which we are dating back to the Tang Dynasty, i.e. the 7th, 8th, 9th century. So I have a slideshow and I shall press the green button to share the screen. Uh, right, desktop two, and we go um, back. Right. Oh dear, I want to go back to. Um, well, the title of my talk, of course, is uh, a trans. Um, uh, transcending time and territory. And basically, I'm looking at uh, material from Turfan that is intricately connected with uh, northern Mesopotamia. And for those who are, and can you see the slide? It, it, it's clear. 
Not yet. Yes, good. So Tour de Fan, where oh. the arrow um, go, goes no, uh, go pointing up to the Turkic and Uyghur empires, that is Tour de Fan, an oasis um, in a very inhospitable region. And it was, of course, a major centre of the Uyghur um, kingdoms in the 8th, 9th centuries. And of course, today still has a Uyghur population that you may have, of course, yes. read about in the paper. Er Erica, Erica, could you try to share the slides? Because uh, oh, I, 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 I thought yet. I have. No. The How do I share screen? Yes. Um, oh, share. Well, terribly. <laughs> is, is that right? We can see a, a black screen now. Now, yes, fantastic. Thank you. Yes. Um, good. Right. So let's go back. Right. That's just that is the site of Tour de Fan. I took it in um, 2022. Uh, no, not 2022. About ten years ago, the Chinese excavated last uh, year. And so there will be some very exciting material emerging from that site. In the distance, you can see, of course, modern Tour de Fan. So um, as the title says, connecting Syriac prayer amulets from Tour de Fan with northern Mesopotamian communities in the 19th and 20th centuries. So um, just to give you an idea of the map, this is where Tour de Fan is. And it, of course, was on the northern Silk Route leading to the Tung capital at Xi'an. Um, <coughs> the Germans excavated four seasons at Tour de Fan, but the material that I deal with comes basically from the second and third expedition. You can see the, um, the, the members of the... Uh, of, of the um, German Torfan expedition, Albert von Lecoq and Albert Grunewedel, who is seated, and various other members, with, of course, members of the resident Uyghur community. Um, they found 519 Syriac fragments from a single location, but as is the case that so often, so often the case in the early 20th century we have actually no uh, locus details. That is, of course, a, um, a, a great, um, well, it's, it's a great shortcoming. The Chinese have excavated and found more than 500 fragments, some of which, I, from what I have seen, can be matched, one or two can be matched with what we have found. Where they have found them, I don't know, but hopefully they have, in, um, of course, improved on the Germans' um, lack of uh, provenance information. And that is the walls are standing to a great height. You can see mud brick, all built of mud brick. And that's me with uh, a Russian scholar, Alexei Nureyev, standing there. We both are acting as scales. So that's just to give you an idea where Turfan is located. Uh, on the western region of China, the Turkic region of China today. Now, <coughs> just a brief summary uh, of the 519 fragments, which I catalogued with Mark Dickens, who, of course, uh, many of you will know because he taught at SOAS, and um, very high concentration of liturgical material. You would expect that from a monastery. Uh, you can see um, exemplars from the, the liturgical books, the Hudra and the Gaza. So we have got rich insight into the ecclesiastical um, the cycle of the Church of the East. These fragments identified the site as the Church of the East. It wasn't known previously what denomination, to, to which denomination the monastery belonged, but it is definitely Church of the East for, for various reasons. The upper fragment is, a, is a, a strange looking piece which we puzzled about, but it is a, a, a calendar, um, calendrical tables, 
uh, to, to calculate the dates of feasts and um, psalters and lectionaries, the sort of repertoire of material that one would expect from a monastic foundation. Very few hagiographies. That was a surprise because, as you will see, the saints figure very prominently at the Tour de Fan in the memory uh, at, at Tour de Fan. Uh, most of the hagiographies were written in Syriac, and my colleague Nicholas Sims Williams, of course, has devoted his energies to publishing this material. Um, we do have a hagiography of Bar Shaba, the purported founder of the Church of the East at Marv, and also St. George. St. George is extremely popular, also found in Sogdian and Uyghur. Some pedagogical materials, particularly, and that is the middle slide, a, scribe, a, a, a dialogue between a Christian and a Jew discussing aspects of the Trinity. Now, this clearly was not a dialogue that took place actually, but it is a pedagogical exercise. And um, what is um, interesting is that the scribe has made mistakes and you can see the arrow where he corrects himself uh, in his text. So these are nice little codicological features. And of course, Interestingly enough, and curiously enough, um, we have pharmaceutical recipes for hair treatments. We're still wondering why we have these recipes for hair treatments. They must have been part of a greater pharmacopoeia, which we don't have, and possibly that material will emerge. Um, and some of the ingredients you would not care to put on your hair, but um, uh, the, but but we it, it's very valuable for showing their recipes. So amongst this material, and of course the liturgical material was known, and some scholars already addressed, for example, the dialogue between the Christian and the Jew. Miklas Maroth addressed that material. But amongst the material that wasn't recognised emerged a small but interesting group of fragments that are, have been identified as prayer amulets. As I said, this material was previously unknown and unrecognised. The prime use, of course, were for protection against evil spirits, prophylactic purposes, therapeutic purposes, and, of course, the concept of illness um, being diagnosed as a result of demon de de demonic possession. That, 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 that concept, which we might find somewhat removed from our own society, very entrenched, not just in Turfan, but right across um, through to the Middle East. <clears throat> now, the prayer amulets occur in two formats, a scroll, a scroll format, and a codex format. And as we will see, the format relates to their usage. And I think this is a, a very interesting aspect and in showing the uh, users um, uh, of, of this material. Now, we have a growing number of prayer amulets being found. Some of them were found within the monastery site at Zipan but others without in the nearby foothills and also at Gokchong, which is, of course, Kokcho, the capital city of the Uyghur Kim Kingdom, where, of course, you can see this image. So the distribution, although we don't have actual locus, a locus and fine spots, is indicative of how these, the, this material was used. Some of the prayer amulets, and um, when we were cataloging, um, Mark said to me, Erica, you know, we have a fragment beginning with John chapter one. And I immediately became very excited because actually what is interesting that amongst the biblical material, very, very little gospel material, significant quantities of the Psalms, which one would expect, 
and also Old Testament material, very little gospel material. So I was very interested. And then I realized that the top and the red um, line will show you um, that, um, uh, sorry, the red line should move down. This is my, uh, well, it starts in, in the beginning was the word. That's the opening of John 1. And on the last line, you see by the prayer of Ma Tamzis and then the broken word, the martyr. So um, this was extremely exciting. Now we catalogued the fragments sequentially. So this was a sort of coming towards the end of our cataloging. And uh, we discovered through the pa paleographic analysis that the handwriting matched that of a much earlier fragment that we had catalogued, Syriac HT 99. They are dislocated. So they both of those fragments belong to a much larger piece, which for some reason was recycled. Um, and you can see clearly on Syriac HD 99, the straight edges that has been cut. And what is interesting, and you can see the translation, which I have produced, which shows that words are um, just cut in half. So what is interesting is that the meaning of the text was not cardinal. It didn't matter that the words were cut. It had a potency over and above the actual meaning of the words. So we pieced, uh, we, we were very excited to find this first tiny little fragment. And as you can see, um, I became very excited because my first article, which last was in 1987, and it was on the anathema genre. And I recognized what it was from that article written so many years ago. So it was, and on the back, when we turned it over and you can see clearly the folds on the back, but it's what we call the strip or, or a scroll. Um, I'm, I'm sort of veering between the two terms, a strip amulet or a, 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 a scroll amulet, but beautifully located in the center, even if the drawing is rather rudimentary, is this clear cross of the east. And I have put the very, on the left, the very fine example of the, uh, the East Syrian cross at the apex of the Zian Forstelia, a, a beautiful example of the, the Church of the East um, cross uh, mounted on the lotus. And here you see the same sort of foliate design. So it's a crude, but it's a vernacular drawing. And that's exciting. So it's clear that the, uh, the, the, this prayer amulet was folded up and the cross may indicate this way up, but it's certainly when you do fold, well, you can't fold it because it's under glass, all of these fragments are under glass, um, it, it, it would have it, it been on the exterior. The, so Syriac HT99 was the very first, and it is still my favorite uh, prayer amulet. It was a personal item cut down from a much larger piece. And the, um, it doesn't actually name the saint. And this is interesting. We'll see this coming later on. The only part now remaining um, uh, that names Martamzis is Syriac HT330, which was discarded. So what is interesting is that we have the two fragments. Whether this fragment was being prepared or was used by a monk, but we, we do have the two fragments, sadly, despite searches, we never could find the intermediate material, maybe the Chinese will, I don't know, but it is interesting that this was in the monastery, maybe it was under preparation, maybe it was a personal item of one of the monks. Um, so the we have very few biographical details about Martamzis, but he is still commemorated by the Church of the East 
on the eighth Wednesday after Epiphany. However, as my notes say, there are usually only seven weeks after Epiphany. So it's a very rare celebration. But he is in the Syriac, um, the East Church of the East um, calendar. And the Archbishop of Canterbury's mission in 1894 printed this. You can find copies of this, the Sugata Mosbala. Uh, which does mention Martanzi. So he was a historic figure from northern Mesopotamia. It's a rare name. And I have asked from the patriarch down if they have any other references to Martanzi, and they haven't. But, you know, I've said just do alert me if you come across anything. Probably a corruption of Thamosius who is mentioned by two Syriac manuscripts, which record the dialogues and letters between Thamusius and John the Solitary, who was a ninth century Northern Mesopotamian saint, often confused with the much more famous John of Lycopolis in Egypt. We don't know the details of Martumses, but it's clear he had a Northern Mesopotamian connection British Library edition, 14653, written in Syriac, dated to the 9th or 10th centuries, again, a provenance from northern Mesopotamia, includes on, the, on a flyleaf a prayer amulet entitled Further the Prayer of Martumses the Martyr. And the, it's interesting that this is included in this manuscript, which is um, hagiography and includes the life of Eugenius and Paul of Thebaid. So it, 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 it's, it's a hagiographical volume. So that is the only other reference I have found to Martumses. I would have thought that a prototype of the prayer amulet probably was imported from Mesopotamia to Turafan, um, <clears throat> hung as the British Museum manuscript instructs on the pilgrim or monk who traveled the long journey along the Silk Road or routes, roads from Mesopotamia. However, Syriac HT 99 and its counterpart 330 were, are not imports. They are written in situ. We know this from the paleography and I have been working um, on an article that will come out in publication about the, 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 the vernacular writing at Turfan. And this is where the prayer amulets are very important because they are examples of vernacular writing, which isn't always so clear from liturgical items that could, you're usually in a lovely book hand and it's very hard to, to locate from where they originated, could be Merv, could be Mesopotamia. But the paleography of these prayer amulets it, it, it enables us to see the vernacular paleography from Tour of Thumb. So it was not an import. And the actual Vita of Martumsis may have been lost, but he was still remembered in prayer and handbooks of prayer amulets that the Christian communities in northern Mesopotamia used until the 20th century when they were largely dislocated from their homeland. And he was, unlike Turfan, where there isn't any particular attribution, it's a more generic application against um, uh, ailments and ills, he was associated with combating lunacy and this Cyclops figure on the left, a wonderful one-eyed figure, is the daughter of the moon. So uh, there Martumzis is uh, spearing and Martumzis is on the right here, his name. He is spearing the daughter of the moon and that is the typical sort of iconography. So he was remembered and he's remembered quite frequently um, in, 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 there is certainly a, it's a, a, a tradition of, of remembering Martumsis. How he became acquainted with the Daughter of the Moon, I have yet to discover. 
And the iconography is also something that we do not find on the, um, the, the Torafan material. This is a, a, um, a characteristic of all the handbooks from Northern Mesopotamia that emerges. And when it emerges is still a moot question because the earliest material we have from the communities in Northern Mesopotamia is now uh, uh, mid 18th century. So some centuries after the Torafan material, which is probably, it hasn't been dated, but probably 11th, 12th century, could be earlier, could be slightly later, but I would put 11th, 12th centuries. Now, come on. Um, so the codices, as I said, um, were used by the Christians and, they, and these were manuals used by the priests and the codex form is extremely important. We do have strip or scroll amulets, prayer amulets from Northern Mesopotamia, 19th century. So that distinction still continued in those communities. Um, who wrote items for grateful parishioners and beyond. And this is an interesting aspect. Um, we were always talking about interfaith dialogue. Um, there is an aspect of interfaith dialogue in the commissioning of these items. And I quote from Justin Perkins, from Artishai, we rode to Elkai and attended a meeting at that village. I dined with the priests of the village while at dinner. A Muslim from the vicinity came in and stated that his, I'm sorry, his cow, not his kuf, his cow refused to yield her usual quota of milk and requested the elder priest to prescribe some charm to remedy the evil. The priest took a spoonful of salt in his hand, repeated over it a prayer and gave it to the Muslim to administer to his cow. Priest Yohanan was much mortified by the superstitious conduct of his clerical brother and apologised by saying that they have an old book which teaches them many such foolish practices. Now, that last sentence is a very valuable piece of information, as is the whole description. I, I, I just love it. I think it, it's a wonderful example of interfaith dialogue, uh, if I may say so. And of course, uh, Ma Tumzi's depiction as a rider saint is typical. A uh, saint in, in, in this repertoire from the 18th, 19th centuries, we do not find this iconography, as I have said, at Turfan. The only iconography one finds at Turfan are the cross, the cross of the, of the Church of the East. But there you can see various. Uh, depictions of Ma George, who of course was an extremely um, um, in, important character, um, it, it combating the Tanina, which is the dragon, a snake-like, and of course this wonderful image of Ma George. And actually, I haven't captioned that, that was taken um, in the Yazidi village, and the Yazidi elders were having their lunch underneath this wonderful image of uh, Ma George. So the, the, whole, the whole repertoire of rider saints, mounted saints, combating various demonic entities was a very rich aspect of the community's life in Northern Mesopotamia. We don't have that rich imagery at Turfan. How this develops is an area that needs to be worked on but I'm not an art historian, as interesting as it may be. Now, as well as Ma Tumzis, we also found a prayer amulet to Ma Cyprian at Turfan. And uh, I have chosen um, this example because we have two uh, such exemplars. One is a codex form, the Syriac HT102. Uh, codex and on the left hand side N3645, which is a scroll. We have also a, say, a Sogdian fragment published by Nicholas Sims Williams, um, N396, which mentions the anathema of Mar Cyprian in mid text. And I quote, and may this anathema, book and writing, be sealed 
the anathema of the holy Ma Cyprian. So that's very interesting that the Solvian, uh, this Solvian mention. So the the um, here uh, where the red um, line is, if if, if you um, have to shift it up slightly, I don't know if I can do that. Whoops, what have I done now? Go back. Um, it, 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 it identifies the anathema of uh, the first word the, it, it is the anathema of and then Ma, uh, Ma Kuprina and, and Kadisha the saint. And up here, likewise, um, in 365 and in 364, the, when they were, these fragments were originally glassed, the um, good <laughs> assistants put the put the the label identifying labels upside down because they clearly couldn't read the uh, the script so this is why the captions are upside down but the the actual fragments are the right way up so they're both to mark Ma Cyprian Mark Prina and we um the 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 codex fragment was found at the monastery site and I suggest it was part of a handbook of prayer amulets. The scroll was found in the foothills north of the monastery at Zipang at Bulayek or Turfan. Now the Germans were not particular in, um, in particular in, in their locus identification, but they did actually identify, and that's extremely useful, material that was found at the monastery site proper and material that was found in the, the surrounds. So this small, again, a strip amulet or, or, or prayer amulet or a scroll amulet was found uh, somewhere in the vicinity. And um, again, it's, dis, it, 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 it's, a, it, it's a prayer, it, it, it's an amulet that has been um, it, two pieces, um, a dislocated pieces, a much larger piece. What is a really interesting and actually was very helpful when one was trying to read the, the, the fragment was you can see, I mean, it's a unique feature at Torfan, the red dots separating each word. Um, so uh, that is a, a very specific and unique feature. And here you see the anathema of, 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 of context, and it says in the name, of course, by the prayer of the saint, who, as he was celebrated in this world, i.e. martyred, he requested from our Lord Jesus Christ, and he gave him his request. Praise to you, God, in heaven and on earth, that something that hangs on him, and I suggest, again, this is the usage of the item, your servant, merciful God, Ma, Ma now it would be Ma Caprina, directed his mind to God. And so, of course, it's very, um, uh, it's, it's a broken text, but it has sufficient context to tell us that it has the classic uh, genre marks or marks of the genre of the anathema. It was a personal item, but was reused. Um, if you look at the larger, you can see this is where the fragment actually ended, the, the, the anathema to Ma, um, uh, Ma Cuprina ends. Here are two Sogdian lines. Then there is a separate uh, text, liturgical text written in Syriac. And on the back is, um, uh, a, a, another Solgian text. So it was clearly reused from its original purpose, but the original purpose is an anathema, a prayer amulet, I suggest, again, for personal use because of the, of, of the use of the verb hangs. Now, um, the texts are not identical, despite both using the title of Mark Kuprina. So they don't come from the same exemplar, but they do, of course, the scribes, whoever wrote these, and this is still a question that we are thinking about, 
Um, it may be that there's a flexibility in writing the text. Certain features must occur, but otherwise there's a flexibility. This happens very much in incantation bowls. It's a very elastic um, way. Of, uh, so you don't just necessarily copy the text uh, verbatim. Texts are not ident identical, but they do share a, a defining similarities. These similarities also occur in the 19th century exemplars, which we also have. So this, this prayer amulet is also found in the 19th century material. The celebration of the saint, i.e. his crowning, the martyrdom, and that is the crux of the whole anathema at the at the point of martyrdom, he utters his prayer, and that releases the potency, the request for, um, for, for the person who for whom the prayer amulet has been commissioned. And that is a, a, a defining feature. So they, all, they always mention the celebration of the saint, the crowning. And interestingly enough, both Syriac HT 102 and N364-5 use this curious clause, or uh, he directed his mind to God, but they use different nouns for, for, uh, for mind, which again shows that um, they're not derivative from a, a single exemplar, but there is... Um, there is uh, elasticity in, 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 in the circulation of this prayer amulet. So there is some, some, there's some difference. A third exemplar, probably to Mark Kuprin, has also emerged in the Otani collection of Syriac fragments, which is now housed at Kyoto. Count Otani um, also brought back to Kyoto at the beginning of the 20th century um, a handful of Syriac fragments. And until um, a year or so ago, it remained unidentified. But my, uh, my colleague, Jap uh, Japanese colleague Hidemi Takahashi, has now worked on it and it is coming out in publication. It's from an unidentified location in Torfan, but again, I suggest in the surrounds. So even though we don't have the actual locus place, we are seeing a pattern of these, this vernacular material being, um, being used outside the monastery um, precincts. And here is the translation of um, Takahashi, and I'm most grateful that he has allowed me to use this material. The verso is actually the recto. We looked at this together and I said, look, the, the verso is actually the recto and the recto is the verso, but you know, that's how the fragment has been catalogued. And again, people wouldn't have realized. Again, we don't have the, 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 the title of the, this strip or scroll. Now, interestingly enough, it is written on both sides. Most of the strip amulets are only one-sided. So it's very interesting that it was written on both sides. And of course, again, it is a very fine example of the vernacular paleography of the area. And um, I have included it in this study, which took a long time last year. And who knows how conclusive it will be because new materials always coming up, but to start to look at how Syriac is written at Torfan. And as he was celebrated in this world, so we don't know who the saint is, it doesn't actually say. Uh, Takahashi, uh, Hidemi Takahashi, thought that it was Mark Caprina, but as I said to him, well, this is a very standard formula for anathemas, and it could be anyone. But uh, sadly, we don't have the title. There would have been a title. Uh, as he was celebrated in this world, and he requested from God, and he granted him his request, saying on the holy day of Sunday, and on which, and, and the little bit of all hideous, evil, and hateful deeds are dissolved, passed away, and are annulled. And then on the recto, and I think it's quite deliberate that on the recto it starts with in the name of, and it is, of course, the, the Hebrew name, you know, I, hear, uh, I am who I am, 
and then the angel Rubael, uh, various, uh, the great one of God, I guess, would be the translation, who is the head of all angels, which is interesting because it's not generally, uh, no, he's not generally classified as an archangel, it's Michael and Gabriel, of course, and Raphael. So whether the B and the P got mixed up, uh, confused, we're not sure. All fevers and all shivers and these evil and accursed spirits. And by the power of his Lord, I drive you away, O evil spirit. Do not fall upon so and so because I have authority over him forever. Now, again, the upon so-and-so, which is for those of you who are interested, is, is, is here. This is the word. Um, um, it's interesting because that also indicates a personal item, but the scribe has, you would normally insert the name of the person who could be male, or could be female, they weren't gender specific. So, um, and th these are formulae that we find in the 19th century uh, amulets from, uh, from Northern Mesopotamia. So clearly written for a person, uh, an individual, but the individual isn't identified. And um, whether it is Marco Prina or not, it is a very fine example of an anathema. And again, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, it's not an import. It is written in situ at Torafan, or where I would expect it would be. Now, um, whoops, I have to go back. I've clicked too much. Um, again, this whole idea of uh, removing illnesses and diseases and fevers. And what you can see in these prayer amulets from Torafan is it's a very generic application. Uh, whereas by the 19th century, they do have a generic application, but there's also specific applications. For example, Martam Zis with the daughter of, Lu, uh, of the moon, i.e. Luinasi, Marzaya against rabid dogs. So they have categorized them to specific ailments. These prayer amulets from Torafan are not. They're very generic. And here are three pieces um, from a single fragment that I have pieced together. Unfortunately, I don't have the technical ability. You, you, you can actually join them into nice one nice fragment, but I don't have that technical ability. So I've pieced them together. So you can see when we reconstruct the text, may you remove from him all illnesses and diseases and fevers and seizures and melancholy. Now that's really interesting because that's a Greek loan word. I've just underlined it here. Oops. Uh, do I go back? Yes, melancholy. That's really interesting. Um, and the evil eye, we do have a mention of the evil eye and all those sufferings and pains. And then it goes on to quote Genesis 2, 8, and it's an uh, amen. And, and we're not quite sure of the relationship between those two sections. The amen is in rubric. You can't see it very well. And then the lower parts allow the reconstruction of Genesis <coughs> 2, verse 8. But you can see the generic nature, which is uh, clearly um, why uh, to, to, to protect against a very wide range of um, illnesses, ailments, etc. Now, of course, prayer amulets certainly were used by the populace at Torfar and its surrounds. We also do have. Uh, we have found, uh, or uh, not we, a, a, prayer, <coughs> a prayer amulet has been found at Karakoto, a Syriac prayer amulet, so that's quite far removed, and I'm just hoping for more material to come in. This is a, a genre that has grown in the last, I would say, um, 10 uh, 10 years or since 2010 when we first identified this this, the, the, the anathema of Martamzis. They were must have been, there are derivatives of Syriac exemplars that must have been brought from Mesopotamia uh, in the outreach mission uh, of the Church of the East. Um, 
their derivatives. We do have occasional Solpian and Uyghur examples, uh, N396, which is Solpian, but is clearly modelled on a Syriac bore lager. Well, all the Solpian material is actually modelled on Syriac models, and you can see this by the, the, the syntax, etc. U328, found at Karutka in Turafan, which is Uyghur. Um, it's Mark has Dickens has described as having an embedded magical text to be used for corralling a horse. It's an anomalous text, and he has written a very fine and long article discussing this unusual um, uh, amulet, a uh, prayer amulet, which is in Uyghur. Syriac, and it's it's clear from the the, the, the prayer amulets that it wasn't necessary to understand um, the, 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 the text. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't a, a, a prescriptive. It had a prestige language. It was the language of the liturgy and it had a potency in that capacity beyond the vernacular. Um, I term these items paraliturgical um, because they have a personal individual application, whereas the liturgy is a public performance. So uh, the, 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 they have a different application. But of course, the liturgy have, has many requests for protection and to stave off illness. For example, 394, uh, uh, Vespers, and a compline from, the, from an office for the martyrs. And interestingly enough, it has instructions to the priest in Sogmian so that he'd know where he was in the service from a bilingual service book. And it says, uh, I quote lines four, um, um, lines four um, to seven, mighty strong towers there is, to our people, Ma Sergius and Ma Bacchus, uh, to our people, Ma Sergius and Ma, and I, I would be Bacchus because Sergius and Bacchus are always um, a, a combination. The power which prevails over all, um, which is released by the bones, protects our souls. Whoops, where are we? protects our souls by night and by day. So this, this very, the martyr's bones had this potency of a protection, and this is clearly expressed in the liturgy. So um, the prayer amulets or the anathemas, we'll call them anathemas because they do belong to that genre, uphold the robust heritage of martyrdom that had that was really one of the hallmarks of the Church of the East and Syriac Christianity. So they're clearly situated within the Christian repertoire. They're antithetical to sorcery, magic, and other malevolent forces. This, this emerges in the terminology that they use. Uh, they act in a prophylactic preventative capacity. They have a paraliturgical function, and here I uh, depart from the um, train of thought of many colleagues who classify them as magical. I do not see them as magical. I see them as uh, acting within the, the, the private domains of, of faith. Um, there may be elements that, of course, are not what we might call uh, the fact that you don't have to understand the language doesn't put them into a magical capacity. It's a capacity of potency, of mystery. Um, and as I've said a few times, they act in a private individual capacity. They counterpart the public attestation of the liturgy and they show a very active memory of the early church in the repertoire of, of martyrs whom they mentioned. What I would love to find 
Um, and we certainly find this in the prayer amulets from northern Mesopotamia, that they, they do mention the great saints of the church, Antony and in, in the Syriac repertoire, Ephraim and Bacchus and Sergius, although, of course, Ephraim was never martyred. Um, and and they, they do mention the great figures of the church, but they also mention, they've become very localised, they mention local saints, um, a long list of, of Ma Johns from Hera, from Hartra, from all sorts of localities that are now uh, lost in, in, in the Hakari region. There must have been local saints. We don't find this to date at Turfan. It would be fascinating to know whether these prayer amulets did develop this sort of vernacular localized saints tradition. Uh, we're still looking to see that maybe they, they, there wasn't sufficient time span for this to develop. But they're very important windows into the personal belief of the communities, which we think died out in the 14th centuries. Uh, but the, of course, the tradition continued in northern Mesopotamia amongst the communities. Now, what has of course happened was that the amulets were brought, prayer amulets were brought to Torfan from the communities. The communities at Torfan died out, but the remnants in northern Mesopotamia continued these practices, adapted them. There are a lot of Persian and, and Arabic loanwords in the 18th, 19th century um, uh, prayer amulets, which one, don't, one doesn't find at Torfan. But what is important is until the discovery at Turafan, the earliest dated Syriac prayer amulets were mid 18th century, colorful evidence. Um, and now we do know that this tradition went back to the early medieval period, the 11th, 12th centuries, possibly earlier. I'm still hoping to be able to um, carbon 14 date some of the prayer fragments, the paper fragments, they're all written on paper. So that indicates ninth century onwards probably. And so they, they, they take this uh, tradition of uh, paraliturgical um, activity right back uh, into the early medieval period and probably earlier and link, of course, with the great heritage of northern Mesopotamia, which the material at Turafan certainly um, upholds. If you did not know that the material came from Turafan, you would place it in northern Mesopotamia. So provenance is extremely important. And I shall end on that note. I've just got a lovely slide, which was found at Nishapur in, in Khurasan, and a beautiful example of the Church of the East inkwell. One doesn't know whether the prayer amulets were written with such a fine specimen, but it's, it is a very fine attestation of the decorative arts of the Church of the East, which, of course, are quite rare. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, dear Erica, for this um, uh, impressive uh, presentation. Um, I was following every single slide, every single line, and uh, I, I have uh, questions myself, but I think um, we should give the audience, uh, and that's quite an impressive 25 people, who, uh, the, the opportunity to ask questions first. So if you could please, um, raise your electronic hand, then I can. Anybody who would like to ask the first question. Yes. No. <laughs> So, okay, so I have a question to you, if, uh, if I may ask. Um, the, um, you, you mentioned at least in two places that the, um, there was an element of inter-religious um, usage of these uh, amulets. 
Uh, do we know from research that people who have uh, re that scientists have concentrated on non-Christian traditions that they have discovered a similar type of um, um, religious object that may well come from the uh, fr from the, uh, the the Christian tradition, but that was appropriated by by others. Um, for example, in well, I'm. I'm thinking of the usage of the evil eye in um, uh, in Islam uh, and uh, you know um, symbolism that tr transcends um, the so-called religious element in in the communities that uh, are religious communities. Um, have you come across anything in in this direction? Well, uh, 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 at Turfan, it's, it's very difficult to know. We are hoping that the extensive excavations from uh, at both at Turfan and north of the Tian Shan Mountains at Beijing may open up uh, a whole horizon of evidence. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, in northern Mesopotamia, there was a very rich interchange um, of, 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 of traditions as you saw in the image, the, the Yazidi men sitting beneath the image of, uh, of, of St. George. And I understand that he holds quite a reputation amongst the, um, the Yazidi communities. Uh, I mean, there has always this uh, area of vernacular prophylactic activity, which we might call, has always been an area that is very rich uh, one thinks of Muslim women who would go to churches and still do go to churches. Yes. To, um, I assume they still do. They certainly did in my time in Iraq for various ailments. So um, the very so I think this area, whereas the the official boundaries of religion are much more um, hidebound, the the whole area of uh, vernacular prophylactic activity uh, is has a flexibility potency being a very prime ingredient I mean the to use a trite example the chap comes in to ask for you know treatment for his cow he just wants the cow to produce milk and he's quite happy to transcend religious boundaries to get the result yes Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Yun yeah, we have a question from you. Oh, yeah, I, I got a, a similar question that I'm not sure it's a kind of uh, also a practice in the, in the Persian church. Um, uh, it, it's common because um, I have been reading a book uh, from Hong Kong, it's Luo Xiangni. He mentioned a, a passage, a kind of a Taoism. Uh, let me say, Taoism uh, incantations, something like that. It's a transliteration. He suggests that it is a transliteration from the Syriac uh, mm -hmm. context. So um, I don't know, as Professor now mentioned, the evil eye maybe came from the idea of Islam. And also, if, if it is there have a possibility that the Taoism maybe also borrows this kind of a Syriac uh, prayer monument, uh, monument? So, so I don't know how 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 it use. I mean, it, how it's kind of a theologically its functions. It, it's it's by other scholars may call it magical, but how we can say it's not a magical. It's kind of a have they have a theological foundation for interpreting this prayer, um, prayer um, manage. Also how it's used, because I don't know, I'm not sure the, the personal use, they can recognize the Syriac or they can just speak it out or how, how to use in the, yeah. I, I don't think it was important. It was rather like Latin in the medieval period where it really wasn't important to have a, um, an understanding of the text as we would require now, it just had its own uh, prestige and its own potency. Um, and um, so the very fact that this is what links me because we see in the range of literature at Turafan, 
we find much Sogdian material. All the saints' lives are written in Sogdian. There's a wealth of, of, of saints' lives in Sogdian. We have very few in Syriac because, of course, the, the monks were, re, were Sogdian speakers and we have Uyghur material as well. But Syriac has, rather like Latin did, has a prestige and a place as the liturgical language. And that is why I think that the prayer amulets are written in Syriac because it echoes that prestige and that potency. And potency is an extremely important ingredient, uh, I think, in, 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 in the religious apparatus. Now I have heard, and I'm sorry, I, I, I would need to follow this up further, that Ma George, of course, a Chinese scholar, uh, did did did, did uh, publish on Ma George in 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 in, 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 in Daoist material, and of course various scholars have looked at the Xi'an full steely to see what the interchange is with Buddhism. Max D wrote a very fine book. Undoubtedly, there is interchange. What we have at Tour Farm to date that's published doesn't really indicate that much, but let us see what the textual and archaeological material that hopefully will be shared uh, from, from the recent excavations, that may throw a different light. The, the regrettable thing is that Turfan, the excavation at the monastery, was very much a um, poor relation to the removal of the great artworks um, in, in at Turfan, which of course are now, in, and, and they are largely uh, Manichaean or Buddhist. So the, the really the, the, the monastery never received the attention that it deserves. And let us hope that new horizons will develop with the, with the new um, evidence that will come from the excavations. Thank you very much. Um, this is a very, oh, we have a question from uh, Suha Rasam. Yes. Uh, hello, Erika. Thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, you kept mentioning Northern Mesopotamia. Can you explain which part, I mean, and you related it to Church of the East, uh, is uh, the central, I mean, the center of Church of the East was uh, to, uh, Baghdad or Tisiphon. Uh, uh, so when you say not in the 18th Arabia, or 19th century, Suha, they were driven to the Hakkari. Oh, this is late. Region. This is very late. Yep. And um, I, the Hakkari. Region. Well, Mosul, is that Mosul? No. Um, I mean, Southern Northern Mesopotamia, I, I use it as a, a very widespread term to include. Um, I, I, I guess the, the Nineveh Plains, Nineveh Plains. Mosul, uh, even extending up to Bokhtan in the in now in Turkey, and of course the Hakkari. And of course, we the, 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 the Church of the East communities like if were, were, were of course um, corralled into the <laughs> into the Hakkari region. Uh, in the 14th, 15th century. So that's basically, I mean, it, it, it's a generic term to, co to cover the artificial division of the region into countries by the and, and Sykes is, line. And its relationship to Turfan, is it the Silk Road? Well, it's not, no longer the Silk Road at the, in, in the 17th. I mean, why is it related? Well, it was related in the earlier periods. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the 14th century, that would have been cut off. What I was making the point was this material emanates from northern Mesopotamia, where there is an extremely rich monastic heritage in the 7th, 8th, 9th centuries and earlier. And the outreach mission to the east and the, the, the territories east of the Euphrates, right through what is now modern Iran into Central Asia and into, of course, um, the Tour de Fan region and further. Um, that material was taken from northern Mesopotamia. There were other churches, of course, 
that did evangelize in uh, the region, but not as far as Tour de Fan. Uh, the uh, Syrian Orthodox certainly uh, were present in, in some parts, such as at Herat, now in northern Afghanistan, and the Melkites had a, a, a foundation at Tashkent. Uh, but the Church of the East seems to have had the dominance. Now, whether that was linked um, in the um, uh, Sasanid times with the court as a sort of a quasi extension because Marv was the, the boundary of the Sasanid empire and it was very useful to have um, a quasi sort of institution because the Church of the East had a great prominence um, in, in the Sasanid period. It was a bit like the British Council. It's not actually diplomatic, but it serves a very useful function. And we do know that um, there, there were exchanges and, uh, between the Sasanids and, and the Church of the East and also um, the, the Battle of Talas, the sort of intelligence that came from the Church of the East. So the Church of the East really has the dominance um, in the, what we might call the Iranian territories, i.e. the territories east of the Euphrates. And do we have uh, these uh, amulets in Northern Iraq? Well, um, we've got many, many, quite a many. few scholars are working on the, um, the handbooks, and there are many now in Armenia because the communities that left in the early 20th century, you took your personal items. And the one thing you would take, of course, was your prayer amulet to protect you from all sorts of evils. And which, which sort of period did, did they use the amulets? Well, they used them up until the 20th century. I am told by reliable I, sources. I haven't seen any. So well, um, I'm told by reliable sources, and I shall not name them, with uh, very reliable sources within the Church of the East that they are still used. Really? Do they wear them like this or? I don't know. I've never seen them. But the use of prayer amulets uh, is, of course, quite ubiquitous. When I was at Nippur with the Oriental Institute of Chicago excavating and the workmen there um, all told um, the, uh, all, they wouldn't show me, but they all said that they had prayer amulets pinned to them. Now, of course, they were Shia. Oh, yeah. yes, so, so, I mean, um, it was a tradition. Now, the interesting point would be, and I don't know um, whether the Chaldean communities um, still used them. I mean, after all, the Chaldean communities only transferred to the from the Church of the East in the mid 16th century, and then on and off, and really consolidated in the mid 18th century. Whether those communities <coughs> that were more urbanized uh, used them, but those these prayer amulets we do have dating, and they do date back. Uh, from because of the colophon evidence uh, back to the mid 18th century. Thank you. But unfortunately, um, the, the example that I showed you from Justin Perkins, the very um, per, uh, um, dismissive attitudes to this material meant that people, you know, either dissociated themselves from it, you know, people be thought, well, they were superstitious, et cetera, et cetera, or they, um, or, or they went underground and they wouldn't show the material. Because my experience, I mean, I met my great grandmother who was born in the, eight, in nine, the eight, uh, 1800. Uh, and, uh, what I understood is that they wear the cross. That was important for the Christians, even in the villages. But I haven't seen anybody who wears something which is like an amulet. Maybe they had uh, written things that I haven't seen. Well, yes, I don't know. Mm. Well, we can discuss that later. But thank you very much, uh, Sucha. We have one question by uh, Frank uh, Jorksaitis. Uh, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Um, 
you mentioned the British Council. You said uh, uh, not diplomatic, but serves a useful a quasi diplomatic function. Um, that got me thinking regarding these uh, amulets and um, the relationship with the sale of indulgences and the way in which a community is bound by economic ties. Um, it's very easy to throw around words like superstition and that sort of thing. Um, but is it possible uh, and is there any internal evidence from the fragments that you have which relate these amulets uh, to um, payments? And the we don't have of community to affirm. Together we, we can only surmise because the 19th century clergy definitely um, made a little, you know, little bit on the side, we might say, from the writing of such, such items. We actually don't know. I, I, I suggest that the, these prayer amulets were written at the monastery from these codex handbooks. They're written into strips or scrolls of paper for individuals. Um, I presume that the monks at the monastery wrote them, but we really don't know. Mm. And, and the passing of money is, is also an acknowledgement of authority. Yes. Uh, and so I, in that respect, it, it functions as a binding of a, of, of a community, doesn't it? To, 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 um, in, um, in the possession of these amulets in, in different parts away from uh, a monastic community. Uh, it, it, it recognizes the authority of the monastery and the values of the monastery over the lives of the individuals who have them. Well, the, the monasteries, of course, um, and I was only discussing this question earlier today, um, it, it has a huge economic role. And the, the, the very fact that we also have these fragments of pharma, uh, pharmaceutical recipes indicates, of course, the monastery has a therapeutic role, which, of course, mm. has often been the case with monasteries. Mm. Mm. So I, I don't know how they relate to each other, but there no. were two traditions of, of, of and in fact, um, the Chinese scholar Li Huan Lin has uh, linked um, some of the Syriac material with Galenic material. So there does seem to be two traditions of what we might call medicine, because I actually do see these prayer amulets in the realm of, of medicine, it's psychological medicine, we might say, not um, um, remedies like you might have uh, uh, as the pharmaceutical recipes or the pharmacological recipes. So I, I think and an interesting point would be, but we, I think we have to be a little careful uh, not to adopt a Western monastic ideal of how a monastery functioned in France or Italy or even yeah. England um, to see how did the monastery function um, it, 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 or how did monasteries function in northern Mesopotamia, in China? And a good parallel might come also from the Buddhist institutions. Yes. But I, I really don't have any expertise in that area, but I can imagine that they are economic enterprises. And they, they acknowledge the value of the written word. Yes. Uh, even, if it's, even if it's cut, even if you can't read it yourself. Mm. It, it, it acknowledges the authority of learning. That's right. That's and, right. And so there's, um, it, it, it seemed very Jewish as well, the, um, the phylacteries and, 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 and the... Uh, so were, were these amulets um, worn in, in any way or, or carried um, by... Well, they'd probably wear out very quickly, wouldn't they? Well, as I said, the one that, that you can see that very lovely is the Syriac HT99, <coughs> which is folded. Folded, yes. It's yes. clearly folded. There's a much larger manuscript, which I, uh, and the prayer amulet, which I didn't uh, include in this talk from the Hermitage, and that is clearly folded as well. It's a much larger fragment. And I should have thought that they were possibly carried in a pouch or, 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 or and it, in the, the um, 
the uh, Otani fragment talks about, you know, hang upon so and so. Now, whether it's what sort of, um, whether it's a pouch or even a silver, mm. you know, um, a piece of silver, which is so common today, you often find mm. pieces of the Quran, etc., uh, rolled up and placed in a silver capsule. So I, I should have met, I should imagine if they were individual items, and I do think the strip amulets are individual items, that they were they were um, personal items that were either carried or hung in the house. But of course, we just don't have mm. any evidence. Possibly we might get some iconography or even more rare to find an example a scrap in the house, but we just don't know. Is there any connection with the concept of pilgrimage, which also seems a very primitive concept of going to the uh, to the birthplace or, or the, uh, the the martyrdom, the site of martyrdom of any of these people and these these um, and the monasteries and their locations and and, and so on? Anything of that? From well, that um, did, did you? Wallace Budge wrote the, or translated in his book, The Monks of Kublai Khan, the two Uyghur monks who set out from Central Asia, not necessarily from Turfan, there's a bit of a debate as to where they came from. And uh, they were definitely going on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They never got there because of the um, political circumstances or what has changed in the Middle East. <laughs> but, um, uh, one became the patriarch, Yabalha III of the Church of the East, and the other uh, became, uh, Rabban Salma was sent um, uh, uh, on diplomatic missions. It, this is in the mid-13th mid century to meet um, the Pope, um, Philip the Bell, the, Philip IV, and uh, Edward I. Uh, on behalf of the Mongols. So they, but their original intention was to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And the, 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 there may have been, but we just, again, don't know, localised yeah. pilgrimage sites. I would love to see evidence emerging of localised um, saints. Now, this does emerge when I say that because I published with Chip Coakley, very fine Syriac scholar, uh, MIK 345, which is not like a KGB document, despite its title. Um, and that's 61 folios from Turfan. It is the largest fragment. It is carbon dated to um, the late 8th, 9th century. So it, it, it is wonderful. We have its dating, very fragile paper, now in Berlin. And it has a, and I have written about this, the memory uh, of the saints, and it talks about Bar Shabba, who was, of course, the purported founder of, uh, or sorry, the purported um, uh, uh, bringer of Christianity to Merv, of course, that great city at the edge of the Sasanid Empire. And he is, it's interesting that in the hagiographies at Torafan, we, and we do have a hagiography of Bar Shabba in Syriac. And it was one of two hagiographies, Bar Shabba and George. And he's certainly prominent in the liturgy. So I expect that there probably <coughs> was some sort of localised cult emerging around this figure. What is very interesting, and I have to say ignored by uh, later scholars because I haven't read the material, was that the manuscript actually says he he brought Christianity, or he 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 established Christianity at Mer, but the evangelist was uh, Queen Sherat, so it was a female evangelist, oh, yeah, and yeah. so that's quite a different take to later historians. But he certainly, and she does too. They have a very prominent role in the commemoration of the saints. It would be wonderful to see. But we just don't know how long uh, uh, the, the, the time span of the church was, um, the Church of the East, when it was founded, when it disappeared. I suspect it died out in the 14th century. 
um, when it actually emerges on the ground is still a debatable point. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yes, Suha, you had a question. No, uh, just a commentary on the question that uh, was asked just now at the pilgrimage. It's a very common uh, practice in our communities in northern Iraq to visit uh, the monasteries uh, and the, each monastery or the saint um, uh, have got a day. Until now, they go, they call it shera. Um, they go in large numbers um, and it's like a picnic. And it goes to very ancient times. Uh, and going to the monastery to ask for healing for, and in fact, there is a very famous story, the cousin of Saddam Hussein uh, did not have a son and he went to Sheikh Matti asking for a son and he had a son. Uh, and uh, consequently he built the road to Sheikh Matti. When I was young, I, we had to walk up the, the mountain to reach it. Uh, and when he, this man had a child, they built the, the road. Uh, so we could go by, by car. So it was a very common practice to visit the monasteries and to visit, to ask for healing. Yes, and I might add an addendum. That's a very valuable point that Suha has made. Um, some of the early English travellers, I read all their travellers, talk about pilgrims coming, I think it's to Mar Bechlam, and taking away parcels of dust yes, from yes. the martyrs' graves. Mm. The, and, uh, uh, the concept of martyrdom is such an intrinsic and entrenched concept in, 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 in the Church and, of the East, in the Chaldean and, Church. And if you, the, this uh, question of taking the person to the site of the Marta, Marta yeah. it's Mar Bahnam. Uh, you mentioned Mar Bahnam. Uh, the story of Mar Bahnam, the, he and his daughter were, were killed uh, by their father. And after the, that, he became uh, crazy. He lost his mind. And his wife took him to the site when the daughter and son were killed. And he, he was healed. Mm. That's this legend we have about Mar Bahnam and, yeah. uh, and Sarah. So it's a very, it's a, 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 this, is, this is fourth century. Yes, it, I mean, I, I can only imagine, and it's only speculation, that the monastery at Torafan, of course, it must have been one of a whole network. We just haven't found the evidence. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and healing and therapy a really major um, aspects of monastic life. Mm. So, and, and pilgrimage. Um, we are hoping of the Chinese excavated north of the Tian Shen Mountains at Beijing, and they've certainly found a Church of the East church, the Tripartite Church, and they consider it to be a very important church. So we are hoping that when the archeologist will release their results, um, which might take some time if I know archeological publications, that we, we can build a more constructive picture. I mean, we have very little evidence, but uh, there is certainly enough material to suggest uh, a localized uh, usage of these, uh, what we might call tradition, or what we might call a tradition of imported prayer amulets. It would be great to find any with localized saints, but we'll just have to see what material emerges. Thank you. Uh, are there other questions? Uh, I would just like to take up the point that was made earlier on, namely on the um, possibility that um, Christian um, elements of faith or of, mater of material, of Christian material culture could have been uh, mistaken for um, Buddhist ones in, especially further to the East. Um, of course, um, some of us here are doing 
doctoral research in this direction, but I don't want to go into this. I, I was thinking of the, um, the 17th century, 18th century when, uh, when I did my own research and I, um, I, I found that the descriptions of um, the um, so-called theoretical material that was discovered by, by uh, Ch late uh, imperial Chinese officials uh, that uh, they could simply not tell the Buddhist from the uh, Christian uh, objects apart because uh, to them they had exactly the same form and exactly the same function. So um, we have to imagine that this is the area where uh, religious traditions meet and they, um, over the centuries, they become part of the local fabric. Mm. Um, but of course, to the, to the local believers, it, it would have been uh, extremely important to know that they were derived from, in this case, Christian martyrs. Um, yes, anyway, more questions. If so, please raise your, um, animated hands. No. Erica, is there anything that you would like to add? Otherwise, I would uh, like to thank you profusely for this very interesting, very successful and uh, uh, very, uh, well, uh, a uh, presentation that will be widely distributed because it will be posted on uh, the um, so as a, a YouTube channel, and I'm going to advertise the link um, perhaps later this evening, depending on how long it takes to record it, but um, uh, it will be preserved in all uh, eternity. Um, you will also have listeners in Russia because YouTube is still available in Russia. Um, it will be, um, we, we can, certainly make a note of it uh, on the website as well for the uh, CWC. So no more questions, no? Well, the Russians are actually, there's a team in Moscow and I gave them a lecture last year and they're, they're very interested in working on this material because of course there are Assyrian communities in mm -hmm. Russia. And I would suspect some of this material might have come with them. Uh, because people do transport this. So they're, they're, they're working on it. And despite all the shenanigans that are going along on at the moment, we, we maintain our support for Russian scholars. And um, all I'd like to say is thank you all of you for giving up time in an evening when uh, you could be doing a host of other things. Um, I'm really appreciative of your um, listening in and I hope that it's opened a new perspective on the spread of Christianity from the Middle East, but clearly with its clearly maintaining its Mesopotamian origins. These words, thank you very much. Yeah, Erica, and thank you to everybody here in the audience. I'm going to stop recording now.